Welcome learners. Today we are going to discuss lesson 7, Major Landforms and Their Economic Significance. I am Dr. Anupama M. Hasija, Department of Geography, Shahid Bhagat Singh Evening College, University of Delhi. So what are the main objectives today? Firstly, we are going to differentiate among the major landforms found on the Earth's surface. Then, we will explain the process of formation of these landforms and to classify these landforms on the basis of their mode of formation. And lastly, we will discuss the significance of these landforms to mankind. See, these are the various kinds of landforms that exist on earth. Now, what do we understand by the term landforms? A landform is a feature on the earth's surface that is a part of the terrain. Mountains, hills, plateaus and plains are the major types of landforms. Minor landforms include butts, canyons, valleys and basins. Tectonic plate movement under the earth can create landforms by pushing up mountains. There are various types of landforms namely mountain which is a natural elevation of the earth's surface rising more or less abruptly to a summit and attaining an altitude greater than that of a hill usually greater than 2000 feet. A plateau is a flat elevated landform that rises sharply above the surrounding area on at least one side. Plateaus occur on every continent and take up a third of earth's land. A plain is a flat sweeping landmass that generally does not change much in elevation. Plains occur as lowlands along the bottoms of valleys or on the doorsteps of mountains as coastal plains and as plateaus or uplands. See, just have a look at this mountain. It looks so serene, beautiful and peaceful. Now, what do we understand by mountains as such? The uplifted portion of earth's surface with steep slopes and small summit area rising above 1000 meters and formed over a period of millions of years are mountains. About 27% of earth's surface is covered by the mountains. Generally, they are uplifted portions of earth's surface which are much higher in contrast to the surrounding areas. But remember, all uplifted or elevated areas are not mountains. For example, the elevated portion in Tibet, which is about 4500 meters high above the sea level is called a plateau and not a mountain. Now, how are these mountains formed? The formation of a mountain range takes millions of years. During these years, the internal forces of the earth which are uplifting the land are fighting against erosion which is wearing it down. In order to form one Mount Everest, internal forces must push up the land faster than the external forces constantly eroding it. Let's classify the mountains. They are four kinds fold mountains, block mountains, volcanic mountains and residual mountains. So let's discuss fold mountains first. Mountain ranges mainly consisting of uplifted folded sedimentary rocks are called fold mountains. When these rocks are subjected to horizontal compression forces for millions of years, they get bent into up and down folds. This leads to the formation of anticlines and synclines. Such earth movements occur from time to time and lift the folds to a considerable height which results in the formation of fold mountains. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a mountain as a natural elevation of earth's surface rising more or less abruptly from the surrounding level and attaining an altitude which relatively to the adjacent elevation is notable. Fold mountains are mountains formed from the folding of earth's crust. When two plates move together, a compression plate margin, 
This can be where two continental plates move towards each other or a continental and an oceanic plate. The movement of two plates forces sedimentary rocks upwards into a series of folds. Fold mountains are usually formed from sedimentary rocks and are usually formed from along the edges of continents because the thickest deposits of sedimentary rock generally accumulate here. When the plates collide, the accumulated layers of rock crumple and fold like a tablecloth which is pushed across a table is formed. There are two types of fold mountains, young fold mountains which are 10 to 25 million years of age like Rockies and Himalayas and old fold mountains which are over 200 million years of age like Urals and Appalachians of the USA. Therefore, mountains are those uplifted portions of earth's surface which have steep slopes and small summit area rising more than 1000 meters above the sea level. Mountains have maximum difference of height between their high and the low points. We find that due to some human activity, fold mountains have become very famous. For example, the Alps. Alps are home to 11 million people and thus the most densely populated mountain area in the world. The economy of this region is based on the exploitation of the coniferous forest and pasturing daily cattle. And tourism plays an important role. Now, tourism, what does it exactly do on Alps? Since the end of Second World War, the Alps has become the winter and summer playground of European dwellers. In the winters, the Alps are very popular destination amongst the winter tourists. Ski resorts such as Waldesler and Les Deux Alps have been purpose built. These areas are very crowded in the winter. And in the summers between June and September, the Alps is heavily populated with walkers, cable car riders and paragliders. Due to huge number of tourist influx to the Alps, it has led to it becoming the most threatened mountain chain in the world. These are some examples of fold mountains. Don't they look very great? These are some examples of fault mountains. Now the second type is block mountains. Block mountains are formed by internal earth movements. When the force of tension acts on the rocks, they create faults in them. When the land between the two almost parallel fault is raised above the joining areas, it becomes a block mountain. It may also occur when land on the outer side of the fault slips down, leaving a raised block between them. The rocks composing the fault levels may be flat, lying or even folded. Block Mountain is also called Horst. The Vosges in France, Black Forest Mountains in Germany and Sierra Nevada in North America are typical examples of Block Mountains. Just have a look at a fault block mountain. Next is the volcanic mountains. As the name suggests, due to high temperature, deep inside the earth's rock turn into molten magma. When this molten rock material is ejected to the earth's surface during volcanic eruption, it accumulates around the vent and may take the form of a cone. The height of the cone increases with each eruption and it takes the form of a mountain. At these mountains are formed by accumulation of volcanic material, hence they are known as volcanic mountains or mountains of accumulation. Mount Mauna Loa in Hawaii Islands, Mount Popa in Myanmar, Vesuvius in Italy, Cotopaxi in Ecuador, Fujiyama in Japan are the examples of volcanic mountains. Just have a look at a volcanic mountain, it looks amazing. Last is the residual mountains which are formed due to the weathering and different agents of erosion like rivers, winds, glaciers which are constantly acting on the earth's crust. As soon as an elevated mountain range appears on the earth's surface, the agents of gradation begin their work of leveling it down. 
to a large extent the process of wearing down depends on the shape and structure of rocks. After thousands of years soft rocks are worn down and the hard rocks are left but have been reduced in height. These are called residual mountains. Hills like Nilgiris, Parsnath, Rajmahal and Aravallis in India are some such examples of residual mountains. Just have a look at Aravallis in India. Now what are the significance of mountains? Yes, they are very important because they are the storehouse of resources, they generate hydroelectricity, they are the source of water, formation of fertile plains, they act as natural political frontiers, effect on climate and they also are very significant tourist centers. Now being a storehouse of resources, mountains are the storehouse of resources like wood, minerals and medicinal herbs. The Appalachian range in the US is famous for coal and limestone deposits. Timber, lac, medicinal herbs and woods are obtained from the forest of the mountain areas like for example Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand in India. Tea and coffee plantation and fruit orchards have been developed on mountains and hill slopes. Next is generation of hydroelectricity. Hydroelectricity is generated from the waters of perennial rivers in the mountain regions. Countries like Japan, Italy and Switzerland which suffer from shortage of coal have developed hydroelectricity. There are a number of famous hydropower projects in India also, THDC for example which is in Uttarkashi. Next is the source of water. Mountain is a great source of water. Mountains have abundance of water. Perennial rivers originating from the snow fed or heavily rain fed mountains are the source of water. They help in promoting irrigation and provide water for domestic as well as industrial purposes. Fertile plains are formed in these mountains. For example, the rivers originating in the high mountain region bring sediment deposits along with water to the lower valleys. This helps in the formation of fertile plains such as Great Northern Plains, Ganga Satluj Brahmaputra of India. As a result, the states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, West Bengal, they are very rich in agriculture. They also act as natural political frontiers. The mountain ranges do act as natural political frontiers between countries and protect them from invasions to some extent. The Himalayas have formed a political frontier between India and China. Effects on climate. Mountains have very low temperature we all know. They serve as climatic divide between two adjoining regions. The Himalayas for example form a barrier to the movement of cold winds from Central Asia towards the Indian subcontinent. They also force the southwest monsoons to ascend and cause rainfall in the southern slopes. They also are a great tourist centers. The pleasant climate and the beautiful scenery of mountains have led to their development as centers of tourist attraction. The tourism and hotel industries get an additional advantage in such regions. Like we know that Shimla, Nainital, Masuri, Manali, Leh, Ladakh and Srinagar are some very popular hill stations of India for tourists from around the world. Now let's have a look at the second type of landforms which are the plateaus. They cover about 18% of the earth's surface. And these landforms have a large elevated area on its top unlike a mountain and has nearly even surface out there. Very often rivers or streams cut out deep valleys and gorges in a plateau region. In place of its original smooth topography, it then changes into a dissected plateau. A plateau however remains much higher above the sea level of the nearby areas. Though normally 600 meters above the sea level, these plateaus of Tibet and Bolivia more than 3,600 3, meters above sea level. Now let's classify the plateaus. They are of three types. 
on the basis of their geographical location and the structure of rocks. Number one, intermontane plateaus, which are wide tablelands that are situated between mountain ranges when a plateau is surrounded by mountains on all sides. Second is Piedmont plateaus. They are situated at the foothills of mountains and are bounded on other sides by a plain or ocean. These are called Piedmont plateaus. Continental plateaus are formed either by an extensive continental uplift or by the spread of horizontal basic lava sheets completely covering the original topography to a greater depth. Now let us see some examples of intermontane plateau. The Tibetan plateau is an example of highest plateau in India. The Tibetan plateau extends to an area of approximately 2 lakh 50,000 square kilometers at about 5,000 meters above sea level. It is located between the Himalayas and the Kunlun. However, the second highest plateau is the Deosai Plateau of the Deosai National Park which, which is also known as Deosai Plains. It is lifted to an average elevation of 4114 meters. It is located in the Astor and Skardu districts of Gilgit, Baltistan. Some more examples of intermontane plateaus are the Bolivian Plateau, the Western US, the Iranian plateaus, this plateau is located between Zagros and Elburz mountain. The Colombian plateau, it is located on the parts of Washington. The Oregon Idaho states of the US. The Anatolian plateau which is located between the Pontics and the Taurus mountain among others. Just have a look at the intermontane plateau. Second is the Piedmont plateau. So uh, let's talk about some examples of Piedmont Plateau. Uh, the areas once high have now been reduced by variance agents of gradation and hence they are known as plateaus of denudation also. The plateau of Malwa in India, those of Patagonia facing the Atlantic Ocean and the Appalachians situated between Appalachian Mountain and the Atlantic Coastal Plain in USA. The Piedmont is a plateau region located in the eastern United States. It lies between the Atlantic coastal plain and the main Appalachian mountains stretching from New Jersey in the north to central Alabama in the south. Just have a look at the Piedmont plateau. Thirdly, we have the continental plateau and some examples are volcanic lava covered plateau of Maharashtra in India then Snake River Plateau in Northwest USA. These plateaus are also known as the plateaus of accumulation. These plateaus cover a vast area like Great Indian Plateau, those of Arabia, Spain, Greenland, Africa and Australia. They may be tilted on one side without any disturbance in the horizontal nature of underlying rock strata as in the case of Great Indian Plateau. These example of a continental plateau. Now what is the importance or significance of plateaus? Yes, they are storehouse of minerals. Most of the minerals in the world are found in plateaus. Besides the extraction of minerals is relatively easier on plateaus. These minerals are indispensable as raw material for our industries. For example, gold from the plateau of Western Australia copper, diamonds and gold from plateaus of Africa, coal, iron, manganese and mica from Chota Nagpur plateau in India. Another significance is of animal rearing and agriculture. Plateaus have large grassland areas suitable for animal rearing, especially sheep, goat and cattle. They provide a variety of products such as wool, milk, meat and hides and skin. The lava plateaus as compared to all other plateau are rich in agriculture since the soil is very fertile. Deccan plateau in India for example is famous for cotton crop because black soil is good for cotton. Another significance is of generation of hydel power in these plateaus. The rivers falling down the edges of plateaus form waterfalls and these waterfalls provide ideal sites for generating hydel power. Another significance is of it being 
cool climate region. The higher parts of the plateaus even in the tropical and subtropical regions have cool climate. Hence, the Europeans have settled there for example in South and East Africa. Now let's move on to the third type of landforms that are the plains. The lush green plains, just have a look at them. Plains are a low-lying relatively flat or slightly rolling land surface with very gentle slope and minimum local relief. They occupy 55% of earth's surface. Most of the plains have been formed by deposition of sediments brought down by rivers. Besides rivers, some plains have also been formed by the action of wind, moving ice and tectonic activity. Plains have an average height of less than 200 meters. Now let's classify the plains. Number one are the structural plains. These plains are mainly formed by the uplift of a part of the seafloor or continental shelf. These are located on the borders of almost all the major continents. The southeastern plain of the United States formed by the uplift or a part of Gulf of Mexico is an example of this type of plain. The structural plains may also be formed by the subsistence of the area. Example is central lowlands of Australia. These are some of the examples of structural plains. Second is the erosional plains. These plains are formed by the continuous and the long time erosion of all sorts of upland. The surface of such plain is hardly smooth and they are also known as penny plains. The Canadian Shield and the West Siberian Plain are examples of erosional plains. Just have a look of these erosional plains. Third are the depositional plains. They are the fragments of soil, regolith and bedrock that are removed from the parent rock mass are transported and deposited elsewhere to make an entirely different set of surface features. These are depositional landforms. When plains are formed by river deposits, they are called riverine or alluvial plains. The Indo-Gangetic plain of Indian subcontinent, the Huanghua plain of North China, the Lombardi plain of Po River in Italy and the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta in Bangladesh are examples of alluvial plains. Let's have a look at the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta which is also known as Sundarbans. Then the depositional plains uh, are of various kinds like the deposition of sediments in a lake gives rise to a lacustrine plain or a lake plain. The valley of Kashmir and Manipur are examples of lacustrine plains in India. When plains are formed by glacial deposits, they are called glacial or drift plains. Plains of Canada, Northwestern Europe and examples of glacial plains. When wind is the major agent of deposition, they are called lowest deposits. Lowest plains of Northwestern China are formed by these. Just have a look at depositional landforms. These are the lacustrian plains, we can see the lake around. These are the glacial plains, we can see the patches of uh, snow. These are the lowest plains, these are the deposits brought by the wind. Now what is the importance or significance of plains? Of course they bring fertile soil, the plains are generally having deep and fertile soil. Since the plains have a flat surface, the means of irrigation is easily developed. Both these factors have made the plains agriculturally so important that they are also called the food baskets of the world. Secondly, they help in the growth of industries. The rich agricultural resources, especially of alluvial plains, have helped in the growth of agro-based industries. This has given employment to millions of people and has registered a market increase in the national production and per capita income. Since the plains are thickly populated, plenty of labor is available for the intensive cultivation and for supplying workforce for industries. They also help in the expansion of means of transport. Since the plains have an even surface, it favors building of roads, airports, laying of railway tracks. So it is a comfortable uh, means of transport. 
then they are also centers of civilization. The plains have been the centers of many modern and ancient civilizations. The major river valley civilizations of the world have flourished in the plains. Hence, they are aptly referred to as cradles of civilization. For example, the civilization of Indus and Nile Valley. Let's conclude. The plains, plateaus and mountains act as a significant feature on our lives. We are totally dependent on them. But some parts are densely populated, whereas some are sparsely populated because to undulating topography do not give comforts of life. Mountains are abundant with resources like water, medicinal herbs, and humankind has been using them since time immemorial. Dear students and learners, I hope that today's class was fruitful for you. Happy learning. And thank you so much.